What's up, future respiratory therapists? Hey, I got a topic here today that I've been dying to share with you, and so I'm going to go ahead and do it. Now, the problem with this topic is that it's so big, it would probably be an hour and a half long video. So instead of doing that, I've decided to break it up into three different parts. So I'm actually, for the first time, putting out a series on YouTube, and this series is over everything you need to understand about in-tidal CO2 monitoring, okay? Now, First of all, I'm a big fan of entitled CO2 monitoring. I think it's wildly underutilized. It's a non-invasive uh, tool that we have that can tell us things about our patients and early indicators about our patients either getting better or getting worse. Okay, So that's my first thing I want to tell you is that if you're not in a facility and you're not learning about entitled CO2 and you think it's something that's just going to be like, eh, I don't really see it that much, so it's not that important. Bear with me because my hope is, is that in the coming years, we see entitled CO2 used effectively at the bedside as a tool that can help us better manage our patients as well as decrease the total number of ABGs that we're drawing on our patients. There's no need for all these blood gases. So just like a pulse oximetry, an entitled CO2 monitoring device can aid us in helping us understand about ventilation. Now that's the first thing I want to talk to you about because what we're talking about here is entitled CO2. Entitled CO2. So entitled volume. So at the end of the tidal volume, what is the exhaled level of carbon dioxide? The, the, what it is is in the name just like so many things I tell you about, right? So, so that's the first thing. Now, this is part one. Today, we're going to talk about the physiology of carbon dioxide. When I say the physiology of carbon dioxide, I'm talking about the production of carbon dioxide, the transportation of carbon dioxide, and the elimination of carbon dioxide. What we're going to do here is identify the main players in the game when it comes to the physiology of carbon dioxide. Okay. Now in part two, I'm going to talk to you about the gradient and how it's relevant and how you must be monitoring this to effectively be using your entitled CO2 device. We'll talk specifically about how pulmonary embolism, um, what its effect on, a, on your gradient will be. And then in part three, we're going to break down the capnograms. We're going to break down capnography. So this is taking this number that we get from our entitled CO2. You get a number, but you also get a graphical illustration of that number if you're using certain devices. And we can learn a lot from the graphical illustration of it also. So that's coming in part three. Stay tuned for those coming later this week. Probably on, um, it doesn't matter because you may be watching this on a Tuesday. It doesn't matter. So let's just roll with that, okay? Very soon, the next two videos will be part two and part, part three of my Entitled CO2 lecture. And I want to encourage you right now, if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button or maybe wait till the end of the video. And if I provi provided you with any value in being a better student or a better respiratory therapist, then hit that subscribe button, turn all notifications on so you be sure and catch when part two and part three comes out. Okay, so here we go. We're jumping into the physiology of carbon dioxide. Now, we know that this comes down to three major players, okay? So I'm going to draw just kind of a, I'm going to draw them on here on the board. We have the lungs. We have the heart. And we have our tissues or our cells, right? Our, our bodily cells. Now, what we understand here is that this creates a cycle, so you have a cycle that goes from the lungs to the cells and then back to the lungs. Now, what are each of these players responsible for? Okay, so let's break that down first of all. The lungs are responsible for elimination of CO2. All of you are in respiratory school, or most of you are in respiratory school. The, those of you who aren't are probably in nursing school or or you're already a respiratory therapist, already a nurse, but you already understand the basics that the lungs are responsible for removing CO2 from the body. So we get that. Now the heart is responsible for the transport. 
Now, when I say transport, I'm talking about the mechanism for which is responsible for delivering the CO2 from where it's produced to where it can be eliminated. You understand that the lungs cannot eliminate CO2 if it's not for the heart providing the transportation back to the lungs. This is through the venous circulation where CO2 crosses back into the alveoli, oxygen is picked up, and then the lungs on exhalation exhale that CO2. Now the cells down here are responsible for the production of CO2. This happens through this means right now. The lungs bring O2 in. The heart transports it to the cells. The cells take the oxygen, they metabolize that oxygen, which is aerobic metabolism. I talk a lot about anaerobic metabolism, but be certain that you understand what I'm saying here. I'm saying this is aerobic metabolism. This is normal bodily function in the presence of oxygen. So oxygen comes in through the lungs, the heart transports it out to the tissues, the cells consume the O2 and they produce CO2. It is then the heart who brings that CO2 back to the lungs. CO2 then goes back into the alveoli and up and out. This is where we're measuring in tidal CO2. You can use this through, a, oh, if the patient is is mechanically ventilated, then they have devices you can attach to the end of an endotracheal tube, and you can measure the exhaled CO2 right there. Or you can actually even use a device that's non-invasive, such as a nasal cannula, who will capture exhaled gas, sample it, and tell us what our end CO2 is, okay? Now, once you understand that we have three players in the game, then you have to understand how each of those players can impact what's happening with our entitled CO2. Okay, so I'm going to start down here with the cellular level. All right, so here's what will cause an increase. I'm going to put increase over here. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to erase uh, this elimination right here because we all know that. Okay, I'm going to erase this O2 because we all know that. And I'm going to erase this O2. I'm just going to create a little bit more room here on the board for me, okay? We all know that O2 goes in, CO2 comes back from the cells, and it is eliminated. Now, these things over here will increase our entitled CO2. Things on this side are going to decrease our entitled CO2. And I'm going to put them in the range of where they fall, okay? So we have cellular metabolism. Now, here's what happens. We know that a state of hypermetabolism, uh, commonly associated with like hyperthermia, an increase in body temperature, commonly associated with fever, okay? Now, when I say this, understand that when I say that things will increase or decrease in tidal CO2, I'm talking about each of these three players, but I'm also talking about it in a way where the other two players stay constant. See, the body is, is majestically designed to compensate for whatever may happen. So what do we typically know that comes along with a fever? Well, we know that a fever can, can cause and produce our patient to present with tachycardia and tachypnea. Well, why is that? Why does our patient present with tachycardia and tachypnea in the presence of a fever? Well, the answer to that is this. In the presence of a fever... You have a hypermetabolic state. Those cells are asking for more oxygen. To get more oxygen, you have to breathe in more oxygen. The heart then has to deliver that increased oxygen to the cells. That leads to an increase in CO2 production. The heart has to maintain that increased workload or that increased cardiac output to get the CO2 back to the lungs. And for the lungs to keep that CO2 level at a state sustainable with life, you have to move more minute volume to sustain that. Now, so when I say what increases or decreases, what I'm saying is take out that compensatory mechanism. If only one thing changes, then this is how it will affect your entitled CO2, all right? So at the cellular level, 
if we have a fever or we have hyperthermia, like I just said, these two things stay constant. The cells will produce more, will consume more oxygen and produce more CO2 and it will cause your entitled CO2 to go up. That should make sense. If you have more CO2 coming into the bloodstream, then you should have a greater level of CO2 being exhaled and it will cause an increase in your entitled CO2. Now just the opposite is true also. If we have hypothermia, This is where body temperature goes down. The cells now consume less oxygen. If they consume less oxygen, then they produce less CO2. Therefore, your exhaled CO2 goes down, assuming everything else stays constant. Okay. So those are the two big ones I want to give you from a cellular level. Hyperthermia, fever, those are, are increased metabolic states. They cause an increase in your entitled CO2. Hypothermia, a decrease in body temperature, will cause a decrease in oxygen demand at the cellular level and will also decrease CO2 production. This is why with a lot of our status post uh, cardiac arrest patients, what do we do? We put them in the cooling protocol. We take their body temperature way down. Well, one of the benefits of that is decreased cellular metabolism, decreased oxygen demand, which also leads to decreased CO2 production. Okay, So that's where we want to start here at the cellular level, understanding how they play a role in increasing our entitled CO2 or decreasing our entitled CO2. Now, when we talk about the heart, we need to understand that if the heart starts to improve function, if cardiac output goes up, so an increase in CO will increase the amount of oxygen being delivered, which will increase the amount of CO2 coming back, and it will increase your entitled CO2. Anytime you have more blood flow coming back to the lungs, then you have an increase in CO2 coming back to the lungs, and that will be a, a, a pivot point for you so you can know like, okay, this is because of my increase in cardiac output. Now, when we say increase in cardiac output, a lot of times we think to ourselves like, well, why would somebody have an increase in cardiac output? Well, think first if they've experienced a scenario or a situation where they had a decrease in cardiac output. See, if you have a decrease in your cardiac output, then you have a decrease in your entitled CO2 because you have less blood flow bringing CO2 back to the lungs for elimination. So a drop in blood pressure, a drop in cardiac output leads to a decrease in entitled CO2 production. An increase in cardiac output will lead to an increase in your entitled CO2, assuming that everything else stays constant, okay? Now, when we get to the lungs, this is the area I like to focus on because this is the area that we consider ourselves experts in, right? And I agree with you. All right, but we shouldn't limit it to that. You understand you're a cardiopulmonary specialist. So these two things should be at the forefront of your mind. And you say, okay, well, what about this one, Joe? Well, guess what? External respiration leads via the heart to internal respirations. So you have to understand these three players in the game. Okay, now, if your patient level of minute volume goes down or is not sufficient to remove the amount of CO2 being produced. So your patient is hypoventilating. Okay, so I'm going to put up here hypoventilation. If they are hypoventilating, then your carbon dioxide in your arterial blood goes up, your venous blood CO2 goes up, and your entitled CO2 will likewise go up, okay? This is an illustration of that your minute volume is not sufficient to remove CO2 from the body, okay? So hypoventilation will cause your CO2 to go up, okay? Now the exact opposite is true also. Hyperventilation causes CO2 to go down just like it does in arterial blood. If 
you have an increase in your minute volume, you're going to rid yourself of a greater level of CO2. And over time, what that does is it causes your entitled CO2 to trend downwards. Okay, so you have a decrease in your entitled CO2. Now, right here, I'm going to give you something with an asterisk on it that you need to take notes on. I'm going to put it right here with a big asterisk behind, besides, and this is a PE. This is a pulmonary embolism. Now, this is going to set me up for part two, because in part two, I'm going to explain to you how a pulmonary embolism causes your entitled CO2 to go down, okay? So, but for right now, you just need to understand that the lungs, from the lungs perspective, hyperventilation causes CO2 to go down. With a pulmonary embolism, your entitled CO2 will also go down, okay? And like I said, I'll pick that up in part two and talk about it. So let's recap here for just a second, okay? Because this is the basic physiology of, of carbon dioxide. Our lungs bring oxygen in. If our patient develops ventilator-acquired pneumonia, let's say 48 hours post-intubation, they spike a fever, okay? The patient is paralyzed, so they can't breathe over the ventilator. Your set minute volume is your set minute volume. You will see a rise in your entitled CO2 as the cells, in response to that infection, which, which creates a hypermetabolic state, they will create more CO2. That increase in CO2 will come back to the lungs and be exhaled and cause an increase in your entitled CO2. If you have an increase in your cardiac output, that will bring more CO2 back to your lungs and cause an increase in your entitled CO2. And if your lungs, for whatever reason, hypoventilate for that patient, then you will see a rise in your entitled CO2. Now, on the flip side, if we cool a patient post cardiac arrest, the hypothermia will decrease the metabolic state that decreases oxygen consumption, which decreases CO2 production, which decreases the amount coming back to the lungs, and it causes a decrease in your entitled CO2. Same thing with your, uh, the transport mechanism. If the heart's cardiac output goes down, then guess what? You have less Blood flow coming back through the pulmonary capillaries, which means less CO2 coming back to the pulmonary capillaries, and your entitled CO2 will go down. Let me give you this scenario real quick. We had a patient. She was a DNR. That doesn't change anything. We still cared for her just like we were trying to make her better, just like everybody else. But we had this patient. They were not being uh, invasively monitoring their blood pressure, so it was a, it was a non-invasive blood pressure cuff, okay? And it was on every five minutes. We were there with the patient. They turned this patient. When they turned this patient, I noticed that our entitled CO2 immediately started dropping. And I was like, this is weird. Wait a second. Hold on a second. Hold on, guys. This is weird. Hold on just a second. Entitled CO2 is dropping pretty quick. And I said, you know what? I was on the opposite side of the bed and I told the nurse, I said, you should probably cycle your blood pressure cuff. And sure enough, she cycles her, her blood pressure cuff. The blood pressure had gone from 120 over 80. Okay, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was normal. And her blood pressure was now hypotensive. It was something like 90 over 54. And the blood pressure was dropping. We cycled it again and it's 70 over 40. And so you see here where you have this decrease in blood pressure decrease in cardiac output, not enough CO2, the CO2 is now not being adequately brought back to the lungs, and the first place it showed up was on our entitled CO2 monitoring device. That's why this is so critically important to understand. Because had I not been there to say, you may want to cycle your blood pressure, the patient probably would have just died without anybody knowing it was happening. Instead, we were able to give fluids, we were able to reestablish the blood pressure and actually sustain and continue caring for this patient because of the find we had on our entitled CO2 monitor, okay? So I just want to put that in there, man. It's so important to understand how all of these things matter and affect what's going on. Now, the last thing like I mentioned was hyperventilation. If your minute ventilation increases, maybe you increase the minute ventilation 
Maybe you turn the rate up from 14 to 18 and minute ventilation goes up, then CO2 will go down as well as entitled CO2 because you are now, from a minute volume perspective, removing more CO2 from the body and your entitled CO2 will reflect that. Now, that is not the case with pulmonary embolism. I'm not getting into that right now, but I want this to be in the back of your mind as you wait for part two to come out because part two is going to show you how a pulmonary embolism also causes a decrease in your entitled CO2, yet your arterial CO2 will be rising, okay? So stay tuned for that, okay? Here's the breakdown, guys. Ask me your questions. If anything I said does not make sense, throw it to me, I'll answer it. I'll try to get back with you as quick as possible. I appreciate all of you for watching. I appreciate all the support, and I hope all of you are having a great time learning how to be a respiratory therapist and if you're already one, I hope you're having fun working as a respiratory therapist. Best wishes.